Bless God. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to be here with you once again. Uh, I want to stand to your feet if you can and engage with me uh, while the guys over there are trying to get the lyrics up. Uh, we'll just worship God. And uh, you might know this song, we've done it here quite often. Uh, let's go. Here we go. Father, we thank you. Here we go. Let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. And we sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it the giants fall and fear cannot survive when we praise you the god of breakthrough is on our side forever lift him high with all creation cry god we praise you whoa, whoa. we praise you whoa, whoa. sing that part right there sing whoa
bless God, somebody. Amen. We praise God. You know, this song came out right before the pandemic. And I love the, the beginning uh, parts, the first verse. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let our praise arise. Amen. I want to teach you a song that you may have heard, may have, haven't heard. It's a very easy course. It goes like this. Everything, everything, Lord, you are everything to me. Sing it now. And everything, everything, Lord, you are everything to me. And everything, everything, Lord, you are everything. my priority and who can compare to you great is the measure of your royalty oh morning star you truly are everything Come on, sing that to the Lord. Father, we love you this morning. We bless you. Everything now, everything, everything. Oh, Lord, you are everything to Praises 
Amen, somebody. Oh, yeah. God is good. One last song. Here we go. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love and My fear, it doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love Shame, oh shame no longer has a place to hide And I am not a captive to the lies And I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh I won't be shaken, no I won't be shaken Come on! My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear it doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love there's power y'all there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name, power in your name. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. You guys sound great. Stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear, it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Whoa. 
when we stand in your love or when we stand in your love hey come on before you sit down turn around and wave at somebody because we can't shake anyone's hand <laughs> God bless you. Thanks for engaging with us in worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Well, welcome all you early risers, my kind of people. <laughs> well, first of all, happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. Yes. And I just pray that, uh, you know, you will be treated real well today, and not just today, but in the days to come. Amen? Okay. Praise God for giving us another opportunity to worship in the sanctuary. And praise God also that we can hear from His Word today. So let's open our Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, we're going to read verses 23 to 39. And I'm going to ask you to stand again for the reading of the Word of God. Hebrews 11, verses 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who, brought faith, who through faith subdued kingdoms work righteousness, obtain promises, stop the mouth of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the age of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their death raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, were, so, were sown in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and in caves of the earth. Let's pray. Wonderful Heavenly Father, God, we just want to thank you so much for giving us another opportunity to worship. Lord, now as we turn to your word, I beg for the presence of your Holy Spirit to be our teachers, God, to open up our heart and our mind that we may be receptive to the truth that you're about to reveal to us. Thank you so much, God, for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So today we're going to talk about triple A faith. Now the chapter we just read, Hebrews 11, is what we know as the whole of faith or the faith chapter. It is a chapter in the Bible which enumerated the accomplishment and sacrifices 
of people with exemplary faith, people with triple A faith. Verses 4 to 22 of Hebrew 11, we learn about the faith of Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and Joseph. So we'll pick up this account of people with triple A faith, starting with Moses. Now, what comes to your mind when something is triple A? In education, we would like students to excel in the triple A of academics, arts, and athletics. So triple A is usually a measure of high quality, excellence, and credibility. Moody's, a well-respected global company that rates the financial strength of corporations and nations, uses a nine-level rating system to measure the quality of their bonds. Now, bonds are debts, IOUs, or promissory notes. The highest rating is triple A. So here is Moody's definition of a triple A rating. Obligation rated triple A are judged to be of the highest quality subject to the lowest level of credit risk. The lowest rating is C. Obligation rated C are the lowest rated and are typically in default with little prospect of recovery of principle of interest. Biblical faith requires three essential qualities. Number one is the right attitude towards God and His Word. Number two, paying attention to the details of God's words and commands. And number three, taking the necessary action to obey God's words and commands. The triple A's of faith then are attitude, attention, and action. One preacher I read long time ago succinctly stated, Biblical faith is our willing response to God expressed inwardly by submissive trust and outwardly by obedience. Essentially, what we do with God's word determines the strength of our faith. If we view God's word as a triple A bond, then we will invest in it with our life and reap the interest and other benefit that it yields. We will act on it with confidence because we will not have to worry about losing our investment or not earning interest. On the other hand, if we view God's word as a sea bond, then we will more likely to ignore it, discount it, or even get rid of it as something that is not valuable. The strength of our faith is determined by our attitude towards God's word. After all, it is in the Bible where we, where we learn about God, we learn about his character, the extent of his power, his promises. If we take a high view of the Bible, we are more likely to trust God for his wisdom, his strength, his protection, and we will be more likely to submit to his authority and sovereignty. And we will trust him to provide for our needs. We will believe that he is faithful to keep his promises. Moses' parents trusted God's promises to bring his people out of their Egyptian bondage and into the promised land. Even though it's been close to 400 years and the outlook is grim, as Pharaoh stepped up his oppression and ordered all male Israeli babies thrown into the Nile River. By faith, they hid Moses for three months because they saw that he was a beautiful child. Now, the word beautiful here is much more than a description of physical appearance of beauty. 
Several Jewish writers said that the beauty of baby Moses was a sign of God's favor and blessings. They strongly suggested that Moses' parents hid him because God has set his divine favor and protection for the child. The faithful action of Moses' parents was God's way of preserving the child for his purpose 80 years later to deliver Israel from their Egyptian bondage. Moses' parents, Abram and Jochebed, had such a high view of God's word that they trusted that God was at work in their life and in Moses' life. Thus, they were willing to defy the command of the greatest king of the greatest nation on earth at that time. It didn't matter the consequences of that act of defiance. And Moses ultimately embraced his parents' high view of God. Moses trusted God so much that he gave up power, prestige, privilege, and pleasure. Verses 24 to 27 summarize what Moses gave up. He gave up his role identity by refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He gave up a life of comfort and privilege to suffer affliction with God's people. He gave up the treasures and riches of Egypt for Christ's greater riches. He forsook his Egyptian life of power for something that he cannot see. Someone said that Moses chose the imperishable, so the invisible, and did the impossible. Rahab had such a high view of God and his word that she was willing to hide the Hebrew spies, even though she knew that such treason could mean death for her and her family. Now Rahab didn't experience God as the Israelites did, She was not an eyewitness to all the miracles in Egypt and in the wilderness. She did not have the privilege of hearing God's word preach or passed on by her parents or grandparents. Rahab did not hear God's word in the Sabbath school. In fact, she probably heard about the power of God through war stories recounted by survivors from kingdoms miraculously defeated by Israel on the other side of the Jordan River. Nevertheless, she placed her trust in this awesome, almighty God of the Hebrews. And here is the account of Rahab's testimony and conversion that she shared with the two spies. She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our heart melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven and on earth beneath. Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. Now note that in Hebrews 11, verse 31, the Bible said that Rahab received the spies with peace. You see, Because she made peace with the God of Israel, she no longer views God's people as enemies, but as fellow citizens that she should protect. Let's talk about Barak. Barak has such a high view of God and his word that he refused to go to battle without someone who knows and speaks the word of God. We can read this in Judges chapter 4. The Lord, through the prophetess Deborah, commanded Barak to go fight against Jabin, the king of Canaan. And God guaranteed him the victory. 
However, Barak said to Deborah, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. See, he made sure that someone who knows God, who knows God's word, and who is connected to God is going to be with him in battle. Samson has such a high view of God that even after his sin and succumbed to Delilah's temptations, he still trusted God. Blind, humiliated, and in chains, Samson trusted God to hear his prayer because he knows God is faithful. We read in Judges 16, 28, Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistine for my two eyes. We know that God heard and answered Samson's prayer. Because in Judges 16, verse 30, the Bible said, that Samson killed more enemies at his death than he killed in his life. What about you? What is your attitude about God's word? When we have the right attitude towards God and a high view of Holy Scriptures, we will be more likely to pay close attention to what the Lord is telling us. Now, many of you probably memorized Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make you are prosperous, and then you will have good success. To do according to all that is written in it. Moses had such a high view of God's command that he paid attention very closely to the details of the first Passover as the Lord commanded him. In Exodus 12, verses 1 to 11, God gave very detailed information about the Passover lamb. The lamb shall be without blemish. The lamb shall be one-year-old male. The lamb shall be killed at twilight. The blood of the lamb shall be sprinkled on the doorpost and lintel. The lamb shall be roasted on the fire. The lamb shall be eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herb. The lamb shall not be eaten raw or boiled in water. The left of a lamb shall be burned. Your belt shall be fastened and your sandal on your feet when you eat the roasted lamb. And you shall eat it fast. See, that was the Ten Commandments for the Passover lamb. I think that God gave us so many details on certain things just to test us to see if we will be willing to obey his every words. And because Moses, Aaron, and God's people obeyed, they were freed from their 430 years of bondage, oppression, and exploitation. Remember Jesus said, in Matthew 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word, Jesus said. By faith, the wall of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. God gave Joshua detailed instruction on how Jericho was to be conquered in Joshua 6, verse 3 to 5. Now, humanly speaking, this is the most ridiculous battle instructions in the annals of military history. Now, imagine yourself as one of the soldiers. You're armed 
you're ready to fight and even to die for your people if you have to. Then your deployment order came. Yes, you will be immediately deployed, but not to the front line. You were to join a marching band, quietly following the priests and the Ark of God. And you are to march in the same formation around the city once for six days. I don't know about you, but if I was a, a soldier, I would be very disappointed. I would be wondering what about the mental state of our fearless General Josh. Notice, however, that there was no recorded objection to this instruction. And I believe this is the reason why their faith was recorded here in the Hall of Faith. And because they obey God's every word, the wall of Jericho fell flat and they had an easy victory. What happened when we do not pay close attention to the details of God's word? Moses, our hero, failed to observe the details of God's instruction at the waters of Meribah, and it cost him the ticket to the promised land. We read in Numbers chapter 20 that when Israel were in the wilderness of sin, they ran out of water. So the people gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and they said, Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness? that we and our animals should die here. And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or wines or pomegranate, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and they fell on their faces. And the glory of God appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus, you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. What was God's instruction? Speak to the rock. A very simple instruction. But let's read on. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given you. I think one of the saddest stories in the Bible is found in 1 Samuel chapter 15. God commanded Saul to go and destroy the Amalekites. The instruction was to wipe out all, including animals. But Saul spared their kings and the best of their animals. Not paying attention to God's every word caused Saul his kingdom and his relationship with Samuel. But even worse, Saul lost his relationship with God. We read in 1 Samuel 15, 26. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. We have to be careful that we do not add or subtract from the word of God, and that we pay attention to the details. Let's talk about action. To have triple A faith, we must have the right attitude, 
pay close attention to the detail of God's word. However, this is not enough. We must take action based upon what we know to be the truth of God. This is where the difficulty comes in for all of us. The writer of Hebrew, after listing all the amazing accomplishments of faith and faithful people, did not forget to tell us that triple A faith is costly. It involves great sacrifices. That's why we read in verses 35 to 38. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mocking and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. They wander in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Triple A faith does not guarantee protection from pain, persecution, and suffering. Jewish tradition said that the prophet Isaiah was sown in two. The prophet Jeremiah lived a life of rejection by his own people. He was tortured, persecuted, mocked, and imprisoned. He lived a life of suffering from the beginning of his ministry until his death. Millions who lived the life of faith in Jesus Christ in many parts of the world continue to pay dearly for their faithful actions of obeying God's word and of sharing God's word. The time is coming very soon, and in some way it's already here, when we have to pay a high price for our faithfulness to follow Christ. 24 years ago, Philip Yancey wrote, The culture war is underway. Ironically, every year, the church in the United States draws closer and closer to the situations faced by the New Testament church. An embattled minority living in a pluralistic pagan society. Christian in places like Sri Lanka, Sudan, Saudi Arabia have faced open hostility from their government for years. But in the United States, with a history so congenial to the faith, we don't like it. An embattled minority living in a pluralistic pagan society. Well, today the history of the United States is no longer congenial to our Christian faith. We are under attack from the government, from the media, from our country's public educational system, We are under attack politically, economically, and socially. Internally, we are under attacks from false prophets, false preachers and teachers, and their false teachings. The church suffers intensifying attack from the outside and self-inflicted wounds from the inside. So... Brother and sister in Christ, welcome to the real faithful Christian life. Just remember, Jesus said that all this will come towards the end. Luke 21, 28, Jesus said, Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head, because your redemption draws near. The Apostle Paul encourages us. No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 
First Corinthians 10, 13. An unknown author wrote, God didn't promise days without pain, laughter without sorrow, or sun without rain. But he did promise strength for the day, comfort for the tears, and light for the way. If God brings you to it, he will bring you through it. God promised. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abide forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Psalm 125, verses 1 and 2. Attitude, attention, and action. James 4.26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without work is dead also. Moses' parents, Joshua, Samson, Jephthah, Samuel, Daniel, they prove their faith by their action, their faithfulness. Now, every one of us can look back in our journey of faith. We can evaluate our victories and our failures. When we were faithful and when we fail to put our faith into action. When I was seven, my mother, by faith, made me go to Sunday school. I have to walk almost two hours one way to get to the house where our Sunday school met. After the people along the way found out I was going to learn about Jesus, they started to taunt me. They called me names. They called Jesus all kind of names. They make fun of me. They kick dust along my path. By faith, I endured and continued to go and learn more about Jesus. Receiving a Bible that Christmas was one of the greatest reward in my life. When I was 18, I nagged my parents for nine months to send me back to the U.S. They caved in, gave me a one-way plane ticket and $500, just enough money to make it for two months. By faith, I left a comfortable life of having servants. Before the $500 ran out, God found me a temporary holiday job. He blessed me so much that I made enough money to pay for two semesters of college after working only six weeks. By faith, I married my wife. Well, that's another long story. <clears throat> By faith, when our marriage was in jeopardy, we left our comfortable life and good jobs and just about everything except what we can fit in three suitcases and move to London. God saved our marriage. By faith, we came to California with one less suitcase. Now, brother and sister in Christ, I told you a small part of my life story, not to boast about my faith, because I have had more experiences of failures, triple C rated failures. Junk bonds type failures, not worth talking about. I tell you, because just like Moses and Gideon, Samson and David, it is not about my faithfulness, but it is all about God's faithfulness. Amen? No matter my failing, praise God, his faithfulness remains. He is indeed faithful who promised. See, in the way, the Bible, which is God's covenant with us, is his bond. We know that he is faithful to his promises. God issued promissory notes, guarantee a hundred percent to yield an abundant return for many years to come. 
How many years? Well, try forever. We never have to worry about God's promissory note to default because it is guaranteed by the treasury of heaven where even the streets are paved with gold. We will be foolish not to buy it. Actually, we must buy into it because we are not just dealing with economic consequences. We are dealing with the eternal destiny of our soul. There is, well, deadly consequences. Jesus said, If anyone decides to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever decides to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will reward each according to his works. Yes, there is deadly consequences and unimaginable eternal loss for not investing in heavenly bond of faith. But for those who invest by their faithfulness, they will reap fantastic return far, far into the future. See, it was during a critical time for Christianity that the book of Hebrew was written, a time of greatest trial for the fledgling church. First, we know that Jews who become followers of Christ experience great persecution and rejection. Second, many false teachers and false doctrines have now infiltrated the church, bringing confusion and disunity. Third, severe persecution was now coming from the Roman government. History records that the Roman emperor during this period <clears throat> wanted to annihilate Christians completely. <clears throat> Fourth, there was a shortage of strong, effective leaders. As many church leaders were either martyred or in prison. All these factors took a heavy toll on Christians, especially Jewish Christians. Many of them were ready to abandon their faith and return to Judaism. Many more were straddling the line, not quite ready to embrace Christ and his teaching. As Christians in America today, we are heading towards this direction. In some aspect, we are already facing the same condition of fellow believers in that first church. <clears throat> and the writer of Hebrew brought up the faith of Moses and his parents to give his audience a historical perspective. Moses' parents were living in the critical time for God's people. They were in bondage under severe persecution from Pharaoh. The children of Israel were destined for annihilation as Pharaoh ordered a pogrom of Hebrew male children. That time, there was no spiritual leadership. And there was a widespread acceptance of the status quo that they're going to forever be slaves to the Egyptian. However, we know that there were those who have been crying out to God and believe in his promise of deliverance. The question for you and I today is the same question that Jesus posed to his disciples over 2,000 years ago. Jesus said in Luke 18, 18, when the Son of Man comes, Will he really find faith on earth? Will he find us faithful? Will he find people with triple A faith? Because 
without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen. Attitude, attention, and action. Amen. Amen. Okay, it's time now for us to prepare for communion. I pray that you have your uh, communion elements. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread in remembrance of Jesus' broken body. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink in remembrance of Jesus' shed blood. Let's pray. Glorious, merciful Heavenly Father, Almighty loving God, thank you, Lord, for our time of worship and praise, communion, Thank you for your word, God. Lord, I pray that when our time has come to see you, Lord Jesus, may every one of us be able to say like the Apostle Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So go with this blessing. You can stand. <laughs> and go with these blessings. God bless you in your going out and your coming in. God bless you in your laying down, in your sitting, and your rising up. God bless you at home. God bless you at school, at work, and in all your travels. God bless your family and all your relationships. And God, make you a blessing to others. Go with Jesus. You're dismissed.